Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody out there in all things LGBTQ land. Um, today we have um, uh, Jaina Asaf, who works for the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls and leads their Free Her TV Vermont campaign. She has been organizing since she was 16, beginning her journey as a peer educator for Planned Parenthood. Today, she is a steering committee member for the Vermont Freedom Fund, unapo unapologetically a prison ab abolitionist and believes true freedom cannot be realized until all systems of violence are abolished and replace them with supports rooted in genuine love and care. Her experience as a black Puerto Rican queer woman push her to fight for changes in society that reflect the needs of people who have been historically oppressed. She is honored to serve her community and continue to work the work of her ancestors. So welcome. Thank you so much, Linda. It's great to be here. I mean, this is such an important um, uh, project. How long have you been uh, working on this project to this abolish? Yeah, with the National Council, I've been on staff with them for two years, but I have found abolition back in like early 2020. Around the time of the uprisings, there was a lot of discourse and conversation around the necessity of police and prisons. And I was exposed to Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. And that text really changed my life and propelled me into abolitionist organizing. So ever since then, that's really been the main focus of my life and organizing. And wasn't Angela Davis in prison in New York? I'm not sure if it was New York, but she was definitely on um, the most wanted list. She yeah. defended herself in court. She I think as a young person, she was, I'm, I'm pretty sure, in New York City. But I, uh, Probably. Yeah. I, I should probably brush up on my history where she was incarcerated. But yeah, she's one of our very trusted and adored leaders of the abolitionist movement. A lot of credit goes to Angela Davis. I love her. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> um, so can you give us a little history about the Vermont prison system and, you know, up to date and like how it how it functions and doesn't work? Mm -hmm. So just to paint the picture in general, women's incarceration really came out of this idea of like the ideas of good women, bad women, you know, so very sexist roots in general. And then specifically in Vermont, looking at women's incarceration, it very much is very intertwined with eugenics. So the idea of who belongs in prison comes from very racialized, classist, um, ableist ideas. So what we saw early in the days was this almost like excess of labor and people weren't given opportunities. So we had like a surplus of poor, poor farms. There were just laborers everywhere that the state didn't know what to do with. And obviously when there's not enough wages going around, people are poor and have to engage in criminalized behavior to survive. Or the state just doesn't know what to otherwise do with them and has historically warehoused people in institutions like psychiatric facilities that evolved into prisons. And looking at Vermont, there was this early classification system of who could be in community corrections and who would be locked up in like more of these secure facilities and the people that were seen needing that traditional type of incarceration were people of color, gay and queer people, people that didn't have intact nuclear families. So we very much see, see these racist eugenic ideas infiltrate the prison system early on. And it has had a lasting effect on who's 
continue to be incarcerated in Vermont. And something very interesting about Vermont's story is our current women's prison, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility, it was proposed as a reform. It was supposed to be this community corrections model. Essentially, they were selling it as a prison without walls, like people were supposed to come in and out. It was supposed to function more of like some kind of re-entry center. And very quickly, that model fell apart within five years. Folks were being double bunked. And we saw that complete abandonment of more progressive incarceration, I guess. I don't really believe in it, but we saw them revert very quickly back to punitive measures. And then fast forward to now, we're in this very similar situation where there's a surplus of labor, not enough social services, and people needing solutions and responses and our state government always defaults to incarceration. So they're proposing this new woman's prison once again as a progressive model, it'll be better than the rest. Yet there's no track record to show that this is actually going to be different, especially with the Department of Corrections failing to do some of the most simple reforms. Like, I don't know if you all saw one of our organizers worked on a piece with folks incarcerated in Springfield's men's prison about the Prince study. And they were supposed to basically build with incarcerated people and figure out how to make the prison a better place. That wasn't, they purposely threw wrenches in that process. So people couldn't do what they were supposed to do. And it caused obviously a lot of, um, mental strain and stress because people wanted to be helpful. And there's just like other examples after the white papers were released about all the abuse in our women's prison, the commissioner was supposed to create an oversight unit in the prison, which never happened. So there's just like numerous records of reforms not happening or failed promises. And we're just not convinced this new women's prison will be any better. And, you know, wasn't there something I think I remember about um, uh, juvenile facilities, too, were pretty horrible there, um, and there probably still are. But I, I heard a lot of about, you know, how much abuse went on um, in that facility as well. So I, it's probably all just part of that same horrible incarceration, punishment, you know, all that stuff that goes with um with that idea of, of, of punishment. So, um, so how do you foresee making changes? Are you going to try to do it legislatively? Are you going to try to do it um, um, by marching on the streets, uh, by, um, you know, whatever means necessary? Are you using all of those options? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're definitely utilizing whatever tactics are available to us. You know, obviously prison abolition has been around and gaining traction since the 70s, but it's still not a mainstream idea. And people still think of us as, you know, a bit wild um, utopian dreamers, you know, and that what we're asking for isn't really something that's possible. So our tools have to encompass every kind of tactic to start changing public narratives around incarceration start changing decision makers' minds about the responsibility and actually effectiveness of continuing to invest in prisons. So we really work through three main buckets and one being political advocacy. So we do work on anti-carceral legislation with Representative Brian Chena. Um, last session and this session, we will be planning to reintroduce the prison moratorium bill, which is part of the docket of policy that the National Council has created. And that essentially puts a five-year pause on the prison design, leasing, all the things that have to do with prison construction for five years to really give us some time to explore alternatives, maybe track some outcomes at community-based solutions that are doing this work already. And overall, just like take a step back, like a $70 million, the best use of our money right now to be putting into yeah. prisons when we have multiple crises occurring currently in Vermont. So that's the advocacy part. And then we do something called reimagining communities, which think back to like Black Panther parties 
very life affirming programming, you know, like free breakfast programs. We're not there yet, but we'll do things like basic income guarantee. We have participatory defense, which is a group of just everyday community members helping people with their legal cases. And the point there is to really transform outcomes in um, the courtroom because a lot of injustices happen in empty courtrooms. So we very much insert ourselves into that process. And then um, we have a few- And lawyers, what about good yeah. lawyers? I mean, you know, poor people. I mean, I have a I have an interest in this, not just because I would have an interest, but I came from a very poor community and actually I was in juvie for a while. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was a horrible, horrible experience in terms of, um, you know, pitting white people against people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and if you didn't join one group, I mean, it was just a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was so happy to get out of there because, you know, I didn't want to, I just wanted to, you know, but you run into like, as you know, if you're poor, you get a fine. You can't pay the fine. Then they take your license. Then you can't drive. Then you can't get to work. It's like an endless cycle, as you know. So, Yeah, I appreciate you bringing all that up. And I'm sorry about your experiences in juvie. That's awful. And that's like one of the main points that we try to say, like, they're selling these ideas, forcing it down our throats of a trauma-informed prison. And it's like, no matter what programming you put there, what color the walls are, how many natural lighting windows you have, it doesn't remove the inherent trauma of incarceration like you're talking about. It's not a safe environment. So it brings out the worst in people. It brings out the worst in staff. You're forced to pick sides. Sometimes you have to engage in violence just to protect yourself in prisons. It's just, there's nothing good that happens in there. And we're putting some pretty vulnerable and traumatized individuals in these systems. So what do we think is going to happen? And that's something that, you know, abolition requires of us is a lot of bravery and courage. We need to want people who have made mistakes to actually be cared for and re habilitate we have to want more than them just to be warehoused so we have the illusion of safety and that's what like a lot of our conversations is about is unpacking this idea of the illusion of safety like there's still harm going on behind those walls when people come out they're more traumatized and it's not serving anybody and you know like it seems like you know it would be an easy solution in terms of you know like is it working Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are people's lives getting better are they getting the help they need mm -hmm. education i mean all of that um and it's not working so i don't understand why government and and you know whoever would just keep rolling with this it just seems so illogical to me that you know this would be what is set up and not working you know yeah. so do we as Americans just have like punishment, like stuff that we, you know, not dealing with? I mean, how are we going to reach people to say, you know, this isn't working and punishment isn't the answer? 100%. Mm -hmm. You hit the nail on the head there. We are fully socialized in a culture that utilizes punishment, that puts emphasis on individual success or failure. You know, we're the country of pull yourself up by the bootstraps. We think that if you work hard enough, you can get anything done. And poverty is almost seen as an individual issue instead of a societal one. Same with mental health, illness, substance use. So that's why as a culture, we really have to understand how interconnected we all are and that we actually have a responsibility to each other to make sure we're not just surviving, but thriving. So yeah, we have to have some kind of epiphany moment about like, wow, we way over utilize punishment. And another piece of that issue is that capitalism drives so many of our priorities in this country. And prisons are a very lucrative business. Like Vermont, I believe gets over $200,000 a year in kickbacks, just from charging incarcerated people for phone calls, you know, like, that shouldn't be something we do. And we have to have very intense, deep conversations with each other. Like, what kind of society do we want to be? Do we want to be the kind that profits off the caging and demise of our most vulnerable Vermonters? 
Are there any like countries or states that you you think of as like somewhat of a role model for how you'd like to see this accomplished? I mean, I, like Sweden or I don't know, you know, like someplace where there may, maybe is a different role model for this. Well, I don't think any state is in like perfect position yet, but there are a lot of states making some tremendous efforts like Massachusetts. That's where the home base is for the National Council. And there's just amazing programming there because they've been building that campaign for almost a decade. And for example, they have this reentry center called New Beginnings. And basically, instead of like going to a halfway home or transitional house, women are there. They learn like how to be in community with each other. They're given responsibilities. There's help finding work, applying for appointments. You know, it's these ideas of wraparound supports. And I think that is key to moving us away from incarceration. Like we believe that you know, it's this one size fits all for society. And I think there's so many of us that could benefit from having some kind of supportive housing. Like, you know, I honestly wouldn't be able to live on my own without my partner who helps keep the house clean with me, you know, keeps me on top of my bills. Like some people need that. And it's not yeah. just incarcerated people that need that support. So what if we had buildings where on the first floor, people could meet their case manager, their drug treatment counselor, you know, like society is set up not in the best way to help people get access to rehabilitation. And then similarly out in California, there's this firm called Desi Designing Space, Designing Justice, and they'll make things like peacemaking centers or mobile schools. So like kids can hop on these buses and do their homeworks if their home life is chaotic, you know, because if folks are coming from homes where their parents are using substances or have mental illness, like it can be a very chaotic space. So there's pioneers across the country really trying out alternative systems that are showing promising outcomes and like looking at Vermont. Sorry, I think I'm talking a lot on this piece, but- No, 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 this is very interesting. Okay, cool. All right, so Pathways Vermont, I believe, they use a housing first model and the daily cost of that is like $63 versus almost $150 a day. Wow. So like oh. even looking at that, like alternatives to incarceration aren't just like responsible in the sense of making sure people are set up for success, but they're fiscally responsible too. We'd be saving money, energy, resources by investing in these. So there's... And, did, and didn't like... The Vermont men's prison, I think, made millions of dollars off of making Vermont strong license plates. Yeah, and they paid them cents to make those. So, you know, they could, that's another thing. You could set up a cooperative business in these prisons, yeah. giving people money, they making their own profits. They could pay back to the state to cover the costs of these programs. You know, like prisons have stunted our creativity. We think they're the only solution when the world is our oyster. We have so many options available to us. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, it, it's just amazing that, you know, that people would want to replicate the same old system that hasn't worked from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like making changes in police, you know, not, not necessarily defunding them, but, you know, like to make changes so that things really work as opposed to never working, mm -hmm. you know, or not working because they don't understand mental health issues. They don't, you know, I mean, so. And that's the danger. System. Yeah, that's the danger. Like, obviously, I, I'm not meaning this as a jab at reformists, but that's why I feel reformists should be careful how, what they push for the narratives they're saying, because this reform ideology has convinced people that we can fix our way out of these problems instead of just scrapping the system, starting from scratch. Like for prison abolitionists, we believe the prison system is the modern iteration of slavery. It just recreated itself to be at this point. And there's no reforming slavery. It's a corrupt system that should just not exist. And, you know, that's what 
kind of our main ethos are like prisons are doing exactly what they're doing which is to control oppress and traumatize black and brown and poor people further so yeah it, it's tough to try to convince people of that though and, you know and and just everything like the justice system who gets justice and who doesn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it's it's like if you have money you're off if you know you're off to prison 100 so, you know, yeah, oh. yeah so um how can people get in touch with you if they want to join help um donate money uh you know whatever it is you need um is there a place they can uh contact you and yeah. we'll make sure I put it on the screen Oh yeah, that would be awesome. Okay, maybe I'll chat it. I don't know if that will pop up for people to see, but you can email us at vermont at thecouncil.us and either I or one of our other organizers will get back to you. We also have an Instagram account, which is at freeherbt. Once again, that's Instagram. And then you can look at our website, nationalcouncil.us backslash vermont. Good. Yeah. All right. So we'll make sure they're on the screen Thank you. and that people can contact you. Are there any last words you'd like to leave our audience with besides sending bodies and money? Uh. <laughs> I would say like definitely appreciate your money and but would really appreciate your energy and time more. It's going to take like it's going to take a mass mobilization of people for this to happen. And a lot of people, I feel like they stay away from abolition because they feel like they don't know enough or, yeah, they're just like, this is something I know nothing about. That's what we're here for. We're a resource for educating. We'll scale you up to whatever you feel you need to be. And that's another thing about abolition is it there's space for everybody. So if you just want to go talk to your legislators, you can. If you want to help us make social media graphics, you can, or art, like, there's a place for everybody, regardless of skill set, age, anything. We we have something for you. So definitely just want to place that call to action to join us. Okay. Yeah. And just um, for last word, what, what got you into doing this? I mean, is it was it a personal thing or uh, something that you just resonated with? Yeah, so a bit of both. Um, so as a Black and Puerto Rican woman, so many people that I've grown up with, family members, they have interfaced with the carceral system. And um, on a more personal level, I come from generations of substance users that have, very, have been very deep in their addictions. And I've seen firsthand what happens when people don't have the resources they need to thrive. And I just think we have a responsibility to each other to help bring out the best in each other. Um, and then just on a spiritual level, I, I don't think, you know, regardless of who you believe in up there or don't believe in, I don't think it was ever the goal to have humans in cages. I think it's actually holding us back from evolving as a species. And like, not to get too deep about it, but I think the human potential is waiting for us on the other side of all these awful systems of capitalism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, our true potential is waiting for us to understand that hatred is not the essence of humanity. So that's a little. Well, hard. let's hope for the election then, I guess, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, I, I don't place my hope in politicians anymore. I know. <laughs> uh, I hear you, but, um, I know they they like to keep up a lot with the status quo also mm -hmm. and not rock boats very much. But um, thank you so much for being on. And I think our audience will find it um, really interesting to hear about what you're doing, what your agency is doing. And I hope you get some response and people write in and, you know, are ready to go. And good luck with all your future endeavors. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you, Linda. I really appreciate you sharing your platform with us. This has been great. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Lamia H., who has written a wonderful memoir that came out in 2023. Um, it's been widely hailed. Um, and 
Welcome, Lanya. Ramya. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'd like to, if I may, read a little of your biography from your website. Um, and I will read it in the second person, if that's okay. Lamia H. She They is a queer Muslim writer and organizer living in New York City. Her memoir, Hijab Butch Blues, uh, came out from Dial Press in February 2023. Lamia's work has appeared in, Los Angel in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Salon Vice, Autostraddle, Vox, and other places. You have received fellowships from Lambda Literary, Aspen Words, and Queer Arts. Very impressive. Lamia's organizing work centers on creating spaces for LGBTQ plus Muslims, fighting Islamophobia, and abolishing prisons. In her free time, in your free time, you eat a lot of desserts baked by your partner. You play board games with whoever can you you who with whomever you can corral, and you work on your goal of traveling to every subway stop in the city. You've never run a marathon. <laughs> um, let me read, if I may, let's talk a little about the memoir that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. According to Zaina Arafat, who is the author of You Exist Too Much, a very interesting uh, novel, the memoir, Hijab Butch Blues, this is, took hold immediately after its early 2023 release and has since won a series of prestigious literary prizes, including the Stonewall Book Award, the Brooklyn Public Library Book Prize, and the Israel Fishman Nonfiction Award. Earlier this year, it was named a Lambda Literary Award finalist. I saw that list and applauded it, although I hadn't read the book yet. Um, it has also been praised by queer literary world luminaries from, from untamed author Glennon Doyle to Roxane Gay, who selected Lamia's de Your Debut for her audacious book club upon release. Um, and this description of the book is from Zaina Arafat. And I read the, I, let me just tell viewers um, that the, an interview with Roxane Gay appears at the end of the paperback edition that I have. Also, reader's guide for questions. So, welcome again, Lamia. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I get weird and embarrassed every time I hear my uh, bio read aloud. Uh, so, this is me um, not being weird or embarrassing. <laughs> well, weird has gained some currency in our um, national discourse lately. Uh -huh, that's true. <laughs> and um, when you in a part of the book where you talk about um the um prophet who talks about s staying with your even if your mm. spouse is a wife beater um the prophet according to some interpretations uh advises staying with this person i thought of jd vance mm. who also advises that uh, women in domestic abuse mm. relationships stay stick it out and stay in so there are national resonances everywhere yeah. but let's get to the book um i'd like the audience to have a taste of it right from the get-go because um it'll give us a feeling for those of you who haven't read it and i encourage you all to for um the tone and the substance so would you mind reading a little and if you could give us the context absolutely so I'm going to be reading from the first chapter of my book. Um, and in this chapter, I'm writing about being 14 and being in Quran class and really uh, just sort of navigating my relationship with faith. Um, in in class, we've been reading the story of uh, Maryam, um, who is also known as the Virgin Mary. And in the last class, we've just read about how she, uh, you know, was raging to God about wanting to die. And I've just been really moved by it. So um, here goes. The week after reading about Maryam wanting to die, I look forward to the next Quran class. 
I'm jittery as the time approaches and eager to start walking to the language lab. As usual, my class of 22 girls whittles down to a little more than half as we wind our way through the school building to the annex on the other side of campus. The other girls are, are unhurried when we get there. They take their time choosing seats and chattering and settling, but I'm fast. Notebook out, pen out, headphones on, ready to start the lesson. I'm jumpy, hyper aware of everyone and everything, anxious that I'm being transparent, that everyone can tell that I'm craving the next installment of the story of Maryam, that I'm leaning in so as not to miss a word, that I'm grasping at everything I can learn about this woman who complains to God and wants to die. But today is a review lesson, the Quran teacher tells us, to prep for our, med for our midterm the week after. I'm devastated. I'll have to wait an entire week to know what happens next while we recap the 30 or so verses we've already read and then review the recitation, the hard words, and the English translation for our upcoming test. Someone in the front row starts reading the beginning of the surah aloud, and I sigh, slip into my usual half-listening mode. I nudge my best friend sitting next to me and ask to borrow her multicolored pens for doodling. Then someone reads the translation of these verses aloud. And mention in the book the story of Maryam when she withdrew from her family to a place toward the east. And she took in seclusion from them a screen. Then we sent to her our angel, and he represented himself to her as a well-proportioned man. She said, Indeed, I seek refuge in the most merciful from you, so leave me if you should be fearing of Allah. He said, I am only the messenger of your Lord to give you news of a pure boy, Isa. She said, How can I have a boy while no man has touched me? I stop. Stop doodling, stop calculating how many minutes till the end of class, stop thinking about the bag of chips in my backpack, stop breathing for a second, my body caught in a moment of clarity that shoots through me and suspends my thoughts. Suddenly, my arm raises of its own accord, and before I'm aware of making any conscious decision, I'm speaking, my voice higher than usual and breathless. Miss, miss, did Maryam say that no man has touched her because she didn't like men? There is a pause, two seconds of shocked silence before my classmates break into titters. Some roll their eyes. This sounds a lot like one of my infamous questions that derailed the class, and some of my classmates are annoyed that I've interrupted their get-out-of-jail-free summary of the classes they've skipped and the things they need to know for the midterm. But I am grateful, so grateful for the tittering. It conceals my earnestness. I'm grateful for my earlier antics that I get to play off this question as a moment of clowning instead of a sincere burning desire for an answer. I need to know, is this a thing? Are there other women like me who don't like men? Who would tell a handsome, well-proportioned man angel who appeared before them to go away? Who have never been touched by men? Who don't want to be touched by men? The Quran teacher, a matronly Sudanese woman in her 60s who has always been kind to me, doesn't seem to read anything into my question and mercifully does not skip a beat in her answer. No, she says, it's because Maryam had taqwa. She had God consciousness in its highest state of being. It's because Maryam was pious and loved and feared God. She knew that the divine was watching her even if no one else was around, knew that the presence of God was everywhere even if she couldn't see God. Maryam didn't want the privacy of her situation to tempt her into doing something with this beautiful man, something God wouldn't be happy with. Isn't that an excellent lesson to learn, girls? Don't ever forget that God is watching. When you're around boys, God is always watching. If you're alone with a boy, God is watching. If it's just the two of you somewhere, then God is the third. Remember Maryam, girls. Maryam turned to God. She asked the man to go away because she had taqwa. But I know. I know differently. Maryam is a dyke. Isn't it obvious? Doesn't it make sense? She lives alone in a mosque with no one else around, no one to monitor what she does or whom she meets up with, and not a person in the world for company. One day, a handsome and well-proportioned man comes to her door unannounced. No one will know if he stays a while. No one will know what they do together. But before he can even talk, Maryam asks him to leave. No, thank you, she says. Please don't talk to me. She would rather have her solitude than the company of this handsome man. Eventually, she lets him stay, but only because he says he's an angel. She hears him out because he's an emissary from God. 
laughs heartily when he tells her she's going to have a baby. Who, me? She says, no man has ever touched me. No man. And I know, I know she was pious. I know she was always aware that God was watching. But there's no hesitation, not even for a second when she turns him down and bars him from her space. It must be because Maryam doesn't like men. Not handsome one, not well-proportioned ones. These things don't even register for her. No man has ever touched her, she says. She hasn't let them. She hasn't been interested. Maryam is a dyke. Ah, I love that. And this was, wasn't this the original title that you had yes. from the former? Yes. So for a long time, um, I had titled the book Maryam is a Dyke, um, which I really liked um, as a title because it was so unapologetic and so out there and and also so, you know, um, uh, so shocking in some ways, so surprising. Um, but uh, eventually I decided that I didn't want that to be the title of my book because the more that I thought about it, um, the more... I didn't really want people to approach the book with a sense of defensiveness um, and uh, sort of like preconceived notions. Um, and I also found myself thinking a lot about um, sort of like older lesbians for who Dyke was a was like a really violent slur. Um, and so I, I decided that I didn't want that to be um, the title. I, I also just didn't want straight people saying Dyke so casually. Um, <laughs> Good point. Um, well, let's talk about the current title. I know members of our audience will probably recognize the illusion in the title, Hijab Butch Blues, but would you mind talking about it? Yeah. Um, I So when I decided that I didn't want to use Mariam Izadaik um, for the title, I found myself sort of really thinking about uh, what I wanted to title the book and why. And one of the things that I kept coming back to over and over was this sort of like legacy of queer writers that made my writing this book possible. Um, uh, people that I read in my 20s, people that I was really influenced by. Um, and one of the books that I kept coming back to over and over was Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg. Um, I read that book in my early 20s and I was just so blown away by how timely it still felt um, and just how effortlessly intersectional it, it was. Um, and uh, the way in which it told the story of this narrator that was, you know, this this the story that was about this person, but everything that was happening in the story was also political and larger than that person. Um, and I remember reading it and being so blown away by that concept that you could sort of like share these stories that felt really intimate and vulnerable, but that were also about the world um, and were essentially a form of like recording and fighting and um, a way of uh, just in and off themselves, the, the stories were activism. Um, so yeah, it's it's a book that I've, you know, read a lot um, and I keep coming back to over and over and it's this writing style that I wanted to emulate. Um, and so to me, um, riffing off that title was a huge homage to, um, to Stone Butch Blues, to Leslie Feinberg and to our queer writing ancestors. Well, I noticed a similarity. I read Stone Butch Blues in the 90s. In fact, I taught it. Mm. Um, I know. It was great, and it is revolutionary. And it ends with sort of a uh, an invocation of an ideal community that mm. we're all struggling. And it seems like the job Butch Blues does the same thing. We're all struggling. We, you know, we may not, you know, have every achieve every single goal, but we need to keep fighting. And I thought that was a really powerful ending, both in uh, Feinberg's work and in yours. Mm. Um, so could we talk a little bit about community? Um, you belong to various writing communities and um, you mentioned that you have a writing group. Um, can you tell us a little about that? Do you still meet regularly and how often do you meet and how did you happen to find each other? Yeah. Um, in terms of your earlier comment about community, um, I, I, I feel like this sounds like an overstatement when I say this, but it, it's really not. I think finding queer Muslim community specifically just really um, changed my life and saved me um, in so many ways. Um, I just I, I remember that sense of sort of like um, 
hope and possibility that came with finding folks um, and just this like realization that you didn't have to live a particular way you could chart out ways to live that you know you didn't necessarily grow up seeing but you know here were here were all these people who were just living their lives and um, you know being like being people in the world and navigating all of these identities um, in ways that were really beautiful and joyous um, and yeah, so finding community really, really saved me. And it's it's interesting um, to talk about this idea of an ideal community too, because um, I think community is both, you know, really lovely and beautiful and can be fraught. Um, it, it's one of those things that you have to put intention and, and effort into um, and is very easily fractured. Um, and, and, you know, it's basically a way of learning how to be around people that, um, you don't necessarily like um, alongside the ones that you really like um, and just knowing how, and like learning, teaching yourself how to, um, how to, how to engage in conflict that where, you know, people are not disposable, where um, you can disagree with people or have sort of like blow ups, but still be around them and still work through them. Um, and I feel like these are all things that I had to learn and um, finding community really enabled um enabled me to grow in this way that I don't think I would have been able to otherwise. Um, and yeah, it, it really, really sort of like, yeah, changed um, everything for me. And not just in terms of like queer Muslim community, but other communities too. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the other sort of like instrumental um, communities in my life has been sort of like a queer writing community. Um, I came into that when I went to the Lambda Literary Treat Retreat in I believe it was 2015. Um, and if anyone is interested, look this up and apply to this because this retreat is so phenomenal. Um, I uh, I was in this sort of like nonfiction cohort and something about sort of like sharing your writing and sharing nonfiction in particular because it's usually so personal and comes from this place where that's deeply vulnerable um, really creates um, a sense of like closeness and community. Um, and I was so lucky because my writing group emerged from that. Um, I went to this uh, this retreat and made friends. And then um, one of my friends from um, from my cohort was like, hey, we should start a writing group. Um, and so a few of us who had also been to the retreat just got together and wrote and brought things. And it was it was um, we met on a fairly regular basis. We met every month and people brought pages that they had written that they wanted to share sometimes they did sometimes they didn't um and i think just sort of like being around other people who were taking their writing so seriously was just so mind-blowing to me it was so phenomenal um i you know hadn't really written a lot as um a young adult um and i i feel like i sort of fell into it in in my 20s um and there were um and so so it was like really easy for me to feel like an imposter um but just being around all these people who like took their craft so seriously who were putting conscious effort into learning you know how to write um differently how to write in different genres mm -hmm. um how to write um how to write like tricky things um it was just so it was so phenomenal um i i learned so much from everyone and everyone was so patient with me um and yeah, I, I, I feel so lucky to have found that group. Um, I workshopped most of my book with them um, and just got feedback that uh, was really, um, really, really helpful. Um, yeah, we, we don't meet anymore. Um, life has kind of gotten in the way for a lot of us, but we recently um, have been sort of like texting, being like, what if we met on Zoom? What if we tried this? What if we tried that? Um, so yeah, I, I hope that we'll be back together. I still, I still think of them in my head as like my writing group. They feel um, so precious to me in that way. Um. Speaking of writing, whom do you like to read now? And what are your literary influences? It's a question I love to ask. It's kind of hackneyed, but I'm always interested in this kind of stuff. I love talking about uh, my literary influences. Um, Audre Lorde was a really big one. Um, the first time that I read Audre Lorde, it, it just like her writing blew my mind um, because of that similar uh, intersection of <laughs> both personal and political. Um, and some of the things I just like remember feeling like 
how did this person who was, you know, um, who was like, who died so many years ago and was living in a very different context, but how did she know all of these things about my life? Um, and I, I just like, I was so blown away. Um, a litany for survival in particular, her poem, I just like keep coming back to over and over. Um, but yeah, Audre Lorde's work, um, was a huge influence. Um, I also really like Dorothy Allison's work. Um, it just, the mixture of sort of like lyrical writing that is very situated in a place and a geography um, alongside, um, you know, well, it's interesting because back then um, memoirs weren't really a thing. Memoirs by people who weren't super famous weren't really a thing. And so a lot of her writing is, um, I, th I think the word is um, uh, bio, bioethnographies okay. or autofiction. Bio yeah. Yeah. Biomethography is more yes. Yes. Yeah. And then there's also auto fiction, which people, which I think was yeah. a word that was floating around then. Um, but yeah, just that blend and just um, the beauty of her writing is just really, really phenomenal. Um, I also really like Dion Brand, um, who is this Canadian writer who, again, writes these books that are incredibly lyrical. She's a poet um, and a writer. And, um, you know, I like... I, I I consider reading to be a form of learning how to write. And so um, those those are people that I read so that I can write uh, like them. Um, and yeah, in terms of what I'm reading now, um, I have a meticulous book list, which I'm now pulling up so that I can talk about some of the things that I've read recently. Um, I recently read Hanif Abdul-Rakib's There's Always This Year, which is um, this beautiful memoir slash sports slash race book um that just uh it it's like beautifully written and just I I I was so I'm a sucker for sports stories first of all um uh and it just had me like go back and read everything and like watch a bajillion uh videos of um lebron james um so <laughs> any book that can do that is worth uh reading um i i recently read um ursula villarreal mora's like happiness which i also really liked um it's fiction and just told in this way that's really lyrical and both I, lyrical and just like like small big um which is this concept that I really like where something feels like a small story but speaks to so much bigger um also a queer book um uh what else have I read recently um I read um Aisha Abdul Gawad's Between Two Moons um I really like that book um it's it's uh, a story of these twins um, in growing up in Bay Ridge and they're uh, 17 and just uh, figuring out their lives and community. And just, again, it's the, the sense of place in that book is so beautiful. Um, yeah, so those are, th those, those are some of the things that I've read recently that I was uh, blown away by. That's great. You mentioned in one of your interviews that when you were growing up that what you couldn't, um find anyone who is like you in your reading, but now you suggested that there's sort of been a upsurge of queer Muslim writing. Yeah, um, not just queer, fabulous. yeah, um, and not just queer Muslim writing. I mean, honestly, when I was a kid growing up in the 90s, it just felt like every single book I read was about white people. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I like, it's embarrassing, but I distinctly remember being 15 and picking up White Teeth by Zadie Smith and just being like, what? You can write books where the protagonists are brown? Like you can write a book about brown people? Um, and <laughs> another thing I just really love about that book is, is that it's about brown people interacting with other brown people um, as opposed to um, sort of like centering whiteness. Um, I just, yeah, it, it's it's such a, such a beautiful book. Um, yeah, and so since then, I know that, you know, like YA has really exploded in terms of, queer characters in terms of um, protagonists that are uh, people of color um, that are black and brown and just um, it, it's so cool to see I, I just um, I, I find myself wondering what who I would have been if I had grown up reading um, the kind of YA that's out now 
Um, and then, yeah, the other thing that's really cool to see is um, so much sort of like queer Muslim writing. Um, uh, one of the books that came out um, like about maybe like six months before mine um, is this book called Roses in the Mouth of a Lion by Bushra Rahman. And what a phenomenal book. Um, it's about uh, New York in the 80s and um, being a Pakistani American young woman growing up in that community coming into queerness um, just yeah it's another really phenomenal book um, yeah I, I when I first started writing um, I felt like I was like collecting every queer Muslim book that I could find and just just trying to read every single one um, and it's so cool to see how many there are um, yeah um, let me ask you um, if you wouldn't mind talking about your practice of writing under a pseudonym. Believe it or not, we're getting to the end of the interview. Yeah. Um, so when I first started writing, um, I I wrote under a pseudonym. And yeah, I, I mean, like when I first started writing, it was like in the like mid 2010s. And um, yeah, I, I always found that I felt better writing under a pseudonym. I felt like I could be more honest um, and more vulnerable. Um, and as I was writing this book, um, I sort of like continued doing that mostly for those reasons. And then another big reason was sort of like was safety. Um, I didn't want to be Googleable, um, which is also why I don't mention um, the countries um, that I'm from. Um, and just, you know, just sort of like having that added layer of sort of like privacy and safety, um, especially as someone who has a kid, um, I, that was really important to me. Um, but what was really interesting to me in the process of writing the book was um, I wrote this, I wrote this chapter about why I write under a pseudonym. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it's been an exercise in uh in navigating my boundaries and sort of like learning what makes me feel good and safe and what makes it possible for me to write um, versus uh, just knowing no, knowing when those boundaries have been crossed. And it, and it was really cool because I wrote this book um, and, and some of it is about having these boundaries and in navigating writing under a pseudonym, I've also had to, um, in navigating the publishing process, I've had to sort of like, um, navigate those boundaries. Um, so that's been really cool um, and interesting um, that it, it almost like gave me permission to be like, no, I want to write under a pseudonym. I don't want to have my camera on for interviews um, and uh, I won't do sort of like in-person events, um, et cetera. Um, yeah. I think it's really cool. It's a way of taking control. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the more that I thought about it, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Like, it's really interesting thinking through what do I owe people um, off my story, especially as someone who's written a memoir. Um, I think there's this underlying assumption that a memoir is a tell all in this way that, you know, you reveal everything, but it feels really cool and powerful to choose what to reveal. Um, Maggie Smith also writes about this and does this really beautifully in her memoir, um, You Could Make This Place Beautiful, um, which where she talks about what she wants to, to disclose and what she doesn't want to disclose. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's definitely felt like a way of um, protecting myself and also being able to share off myself that I'm choosing what to share. Believe it or not, we're reaching the conclusion of the interview. So I was wondering if you would mind sharing some final commentary with our audience, last words. And we, you know, we just scratched the surface of what we we're going to talk about, which often happens. So we'll have to invite you back again soon. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't have anything. I don't have any meaningful last words um, to add, but. Uh, yeah, um, I guess uh, support authors, um, buy from local bookstores. Um, also, there's, you know, um, a really horrific ongoing genocide going on right now. Um, one of the things that um, one of the things that my friend has been talking a lot about is this idea of sort of like talking about the genocide happening in Palestine whenever you have a mic. So um, this is me doing that. Um, uh, 
we there has been some really brutal stuff that um, I've been reading about on Twitter that hasn't been covered in mainstream um, news and just a just a reminder for folks to seek out um, to seek out news sources that are um, actually reporting on the sort of like carnage that is happening in Palestine, not just in Gaza but also in the West Bank. Well, I watch um, Democracy Now. Yes, that's the only mainstream media that pays any attention. Yes, it's really discouraging. But uh, you end the memoir on a note of hope and activism, and I think um, those are worthy um, aspirations that we uh, all could try to adhere to. Well, let me finish up then by saying it's a wonderful memoir. It's a braided, you'd call it a braided narrative, right? You yes. Inter- stories of the prophets with your own life and have a lot of insights. Um, the framing is spectacular. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself too. Mm. Um, we read it in our book group. We love the idea that um, you talk about coming out as inviting in instead mm-hmm. of emerging from a dark closet. Uh, I personally love the pogo stick episode. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to read the memoir to learn about that. And there's also a bad date sequence. It's really a hoot and you know, <laughs> um, make you smile. So it's a wonderful um, memoir, Lamia, and I really appreciate your coming in to talk about it with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.